How's it going, everybody? Brian Alvarez here on Wrestling Observer Live. We are here every day, Monday through Friday, New Pacific 3 Eastern, Sunday 3 Pacific 6 Eastern, Saturday mornings with Jim Valley, 10 a.m. Pacific 1 Eastern, Sundays with Andrew Zarian. And yes, I'm here on a Friday. That's right. And we got a lot to talk about here today. Because it is Friday, and you know what that means. Well, we got SmackDown here tonight. We've got Forbidden Door coming up this weekend. We have got Collision, which has actually already been taped, but I won't spoil it, but I do have a lineup for you. And, uh, of course, all of the news as well, including, yes, we got the Dynamite rating, and we're going to talk about that. This, of of course, coming off last week's hideously low number, and uh, my prediction had been that it would be largely back to normal. Uh, The viewership did not hit what I thought, but uh, it was... In terms of viewership, largely back to normal, although there is not all good news, as we'll talk about here today. Also got some notes on Mercedes and uh, WWE, Hulk Hogan talks about Braun Breaker, and we are going to have a lot of time today to take your phone calls, yes, your phone calls, your emails and text messages. We'll be uh, taking phone calls through Sports Byline, 1-800-878-PLAY, 1-800-878-7529. Don't call yet. we got a ways to go, unless you want to sit on hold for like 30 minutes. You can text me, 425-780-7566. That is 425-780-7566. F4W online at gmail.com is the email, F4W online at gmail.com. And, of course, you can always find me on Threads, Instagram, and Cameo. And, of course, up there on X, at Brian Alvarez. It is going to be Fun Friday today, so get ready. Back in a moment, Observer Live. Yes, I am here. It's time for some Fun Friday. Right, Mike? I'm having a blast, boss. Yeah. You ready ready to have some fun here on Friday? I am. It's yes. fun Friday. Of course I am. Well, we're going to have some fun here today because we're going to well, start off we by need frauds. talking about ratings. The, oh. Well, I mean, it's an important story because last week, Dynamite died a death. Yeah, it did. And uh, we were talking about, yay, what's going on? You know, there, uh, how many people wrote how many wacky things about that number? And uh, You didn't give enough credit to Kendrick. To, uh, to recap very quickly. Uh, the there there are a lot of problems with dynamite and uh it's funny because i i watched the dynamite show on wednesday and you know when it was over i wrote that was a great show because i write the reports which by the way you can get those reports as a wrestlingobserver.com subscriber my exclusive television reports also if you're a subscriber on my on my X, my Twitter, you can get those there as well. But anyway, I write up the whole report, and then I, you know, had a conclusion at the end, sent it to the editors, or whatever. And uh, when it was over, I was like, that was a great show. And then, I'm not saying it wasn't a great show, but when you start going back and you start looking at the show, you sort of realize, well, not great. I mean, it was fine, but like, you know, you start to see all of the things that we've all been talking about for, for a long time now. But, you know, there are definitely there are definitely issues with Dynamite, and there's a reason that things are down year over year. But, but last week's number was, like, extraordinarily low. And, you know, shows... Listen, I lived through WCW. Many of us did. We watched Who Killed WCW. You know, there was a there was an story they told about uh, the, the February... Uh, WCW pay-per-view. They did a show every February, a pay-per-view. And in I, I believe it was uh, it was like uh, 1998, the February pay-per-view was headlined by Hulk Hogan and Ric Flair, I believe. And then 99 in February, it was also headlined by Hulk Hogan. The exact same match, okay? The same pay-per-view in the same month, the exact same main event, and we're talking one year later. Down like 85% or some ridiculous number, okay? That is a massive, massive drop. But you know what that was? It was year over year. There was 52 weeks in between. No matter how bad WCW was, 
and it was horrible. You never see just one week, all of a sudden, nobody's watching anymore. It's always a slow and steady decline over a long period of time, which we have seen with Dynamite for reasons that we talk about a lot. It's not declining nearly as quickly as WCW because WCW was significantly worse. But the point is, last week's number was so bad, it's like something happened here. Like, it was so bad that initially everybody had to double-check to make sure it wasn't a Nielsen glitch. I don't know if people remember that, but, you know, before everybody posted the number, they were like, this has got to be a glitch or something. And Brandon Thurston checked, Dave checked. I was like, no, that actually isn't a glitch. So... There was one major difference from a normal week, and that was because it was Juneteenth, they aired Black Panther as the lead-in instead of Big Bang Theory. And Big Bang Theory normally does, like between, I forget what Dave said, I mean, it's like between a .13 and a .22 in 18 to 49. It's like pretty, pretty impressive. And Black Panther did a 0.04. 0.04. So they had 97,000 viewers as the lead into that dynamite. And, you know, I said it before, this is not a full defense of the show because, you know, there's a lot of issues here. But that's a big deal. And when the Big Bang Theory returns this coming Wednesday... My prediction was they were going to be back to normal or largely back to normal. Well, the number came out 680,000 viewers. It did a 0.22. And that is with the Big Bang Theory back. And, uh, you know, they're still down significantly year over year. But compared to the, the four week average of Dynamite, I believe they were down like 0.1% from their four-week average or something. They basically were back to normal, okay? Now, here's the thing, okay? It's not like all celebratory that they were back to normal. Black Panther did teach us something very important, which is that without the Big Bang Theory, this is your dynamite viewership probably on an average week. And if you look at the collision numbers and you look at the rampage numbers, like it, it does appear that their base audience, if you just throw them on television, and, and you know, before it was like, well, Dynamite's the A show. Well, it kind of looks like Dynamite might be the A show because of their lead in. Because when you take that lead in out, Dynamite and Collision are doing roughly the same. That's the base audience of AEW. Now, obviously, the, the good news is, you know, TNT, TB, they don't care. <laughs> if, if you've got a lead-in that helps you do a .23 or a .28 or whatever they're doing, that, that's fine. You know, that's, that's what they want. And, you know, the story of, of wrestling and TV is, hey, you know, Silk Stockings is going to follow Raw or The Ultimate Fighter is going to follow Raw. You know, place, shows are put in certain places to benefit from lead-in. So... You know, I, I, I'm sure that WBD is fine with the way things are going because these are the numbers they're getting. So anyway, uh, Brandon Thurston posted the quarters. And uh, last week with Black Panther, the opening quarter did 586,000 viewers. This week with the Big Bang Theory, 846. So 586 to 846. Almost 300,000 additional viewers started out dynamite because Big Bang Theory was the lead-in. And, you know, you can't say, well, it was MGF because MGF was there last week. In fact, the opening quarter last week was much stronger than the opening segment this week. This week was MGF talking to Daniel Garcia. Last week was MGF and Roosh in a match with no commercial interruptions. So even last week's 586 or whatever, like, that's heavily inflated by having no commercials. So, although they didn't have a commercial in the first segment either, but, you know, the point is, Big Bang Theory, I mean, it was a giant lead-in, and that boosted the entire show, and you can look, you know, Brandon's got, here's what the show does over, over the four-week average or whatever, and last week's show, if the average was here, last week was here, and uh, the lead-in was a huge part of that, so... Anyway, there's there's really a lot to learn here. It's not quite as simplistic as, 
well, when you don't have a good lead in, you're not going to do very well. I mean, there's a lot of things to look at here. What is your base audience? Why? You know, what segments help and what segments don't? I mean, last week's low number was just like a straight line all the way across. Uh, this week with the lead in, they had ups and downs. I mean, they lost a lot of people from the lead in. They went from 846 to 613 in the first hour. Ooh. That's a giant drop. But you know what? Then they went from 613 to like 717, and they had huge growth, and then a little bit of a decline. So if you guys want to know the big quarters, well, the big quarter was the opener because it had MGF and the, uh, and the Big Bang Theory. The uh, other two highest-rated quarters involved Mariah May, Mina Shirakawa, and uh, Tony Storm, and also Chris Jericho and the Learning Tree. So as far as, like, you know, what did the numbers here on this show, I mean, I'm not saying that this is how they should book. I'm, not, I'm just saying this week, everything sports entertainment did better than straight up wrestling matches so you're saying the people wanted to see obviously a bunch of boobs well they wanted to see they wanted to see characters is what they wanted to see the characters meant more for viewership on this show than the bangers the big matches the forbidden door stars i mean mjf out there being mjf was one mina shirakawa and the whole you know that was two, and then Jericho and the Learning Tree, that was three. Those were the three highest rated quarters. So anyway, back in a moment with more Observer Live. So uh, Lucha, yes. Lucha Gatto here says, uh huh. let me get this straight. People are, I guess, at a wrestling show for everything but wrestling. Basically well, he's saying, you know, wrestling show you know how come they were more, most interested in the non-wrestling stuff here on the show? Well, I mean. USA told you, member, characters welcome. Uh, here's here's the deal, everybody. I mean, you know, stars are too in coherent storylines. I, I I know this is going to come as a surprise, but wrestling fans actually do like wrestling. Okay, they do. They but do. it's literally it's literally the same thing that we've talked about for a thousand years. You remember your coworkers at the bar? Yeah, yeah. Yes, if your boss and uh, and the guy behind the counter get in a fight at the bar. You're going to be way more into it than if two randos who walked in you never saw them before in your life get in a fight at the bar. R.I.P. Big Walt. Okay. Yeah, Big Walt. Rest in peace, Big Walt. And listen, I am, I am a big wrestling fan, okay? Like, I enjoyed Zack Sabre Jr. and Kyle O'Reilly. But, you know, people here, they're looking at the quarters and they go, oh, yeah, well, after the Jericho segment, there was a huge plunge. Because they want to say everyone turned off after the Jericho segment. But what happened was the next segment was Zack Sabre Jr. and Kyle O'Reilly. Now, as a wrestling match, I enjoyed that wrestling match. Okay? I had a fun time watching it. And clearly, I can even tell you the exact number. I mean, uh, you know, 637,000 people also really like that wrestling match. Okay? But a lot of people didn't watch it. And that doesn't mean they don't like wrestling, okay? There's a million wrestling matches they can watch. Maybe they'd had their fill of wrestling this week. And have, listen, Zack Sabre Jr. and Kyle O'Reilly, if you are an AEW sicko, match is great. I can't wait to watch those guys have a match. I enjoyed it a lot. But who is Kyle O'Reilly? He's a guy that loses every last single match he ever has. He's facing Zack Sabre Jr. as a build towards Forbidden Door. You know exactly who's going to win from the moment it's announced. There is no doubt whatsoever. If you're not an AEW sicko, you really only have a passing knowledge of who Zack Sabre Jr. even is. So, yeah, it's not that people don't like wrestling, but when you have Mina Shirakawa and Tony Storm and Mariah May... And yes, they're good-looking women, and they're out there dancing. And, you know, people were way more, way more into that than Kyle O'Reilly versus Zack Sabre Jr. And even, you know, even the main event segment, like, you know, I liked the match. I liked the story they told, okay? But the uh, the tag match where, where uh, Will Ospreay and Swerve teamed up together, you know, that, that did 615, 
And then the final quarter, 617. And, you know, yes, obviously the end of the show, usually, you know, matches don't do as well. But both of those are way below the average. They're they're below the average, like quite significantly, actually. Usually the main event of the show does around 700. This did 615. And even though I liked the match, okay, there is the obvious question. Why are they facing the Gates of Agony? You know who's going to win. There's no doubt whatsoever. Why are they even teaming up together? They're rivals of the pay-per-view. There was like no interview segment or challenge or... It was just one day it was announced they will be teaming together to take on a team that never wins and we know the outcome. So it's not people don't like wrestling, but why was this happening? People weren't interested in it enough to spend the time to watch it. So, yeah, these are the problems we've been talking about with Dynamite. There's a lot of things like this on the show. I mean... You know, I love the the Blackpool Combat Club, but um, that match lost 150,000 viewers from the opening segment. And then when they brought out all of those people, you know, the Naitos and the Danielsons, 631 fell even further. So as a fan, did I enjoy it? I thought that match was great, but... Why did we have John Moxley, Wheeler, and Claudio versus Shingo, Hiromu, and Titan? It was just made. It was just announced. It was thrown out there cold to be a good match. And as you can see from the viewership, that's not enough for a lot of fans. They want to watch wrestling, but they want to see Walt. They want to see, they want to understand why the match is happening. They want to understand the characters. You know, that's that's it's a combination of many things. And on this show, there were a lot of segments where they didn't get that. They just got here's a match. Watch also, it. Uh, it's also how you utilize those characters as well, too, because I'm sure that there are people that once MJF stepped back on the scene again, wanted him to be the MJF of old. And we've seen some flashes of that. But we've also now had to see this guy who showed a lot of vulnerability before now still have to be a little bit vulnerable out there because he's trying to help put over Daniel Garcia. He's trying to help solidify Will Ospreay as a match that people want to see down the line and make sure that Will Ospreay is on the same footing that he is. The problem with that, though, is they really need a strong standout character right now. And Swerve, I don't think, has gotten to that level you know, just because they have been cold and they have had their issues. And so I don't know. You know, I like the idea of getting Daniel Garcia serious. I like the idea of not doing a stop and start with him. I like the idea of him being rubbed up against by these main eventers. But was that the best way to open the show? Garcia is not great on the mic yet. And yes, he needs time and all that stuff. But you're at a time right now where you're you're pretty cold. And most of this show is under 600,000. I mean, you throw out that first quarter, you're essentially starting at 706. And the highest that you got was 717. You know, you talked about how the number, it wasn't down all that much from the last four weeks. Three of those weeks have been the lowest that AEW has done in 2024. Yes, and this 18 to 49, I think, was the second lowest of all time. Yeah, and you started the year in the 800s at a time where... Again, you have to maybe bottom out before you can come back up again. I thought that that was at the beginning of the year, and I thought getting MJF back and slowly getting some people back and into the mix would help matters. But the bottom line is you lost a lot of WWE people, and there are a lot of wrestling fans out there that are fine with one thing, and they're fine with one NFL and they're fine with one UFC and you need to have all these other organizations around to feed and things like that. You want to have things because I just like watching fights the same way. I just like sometimes watching wrestling matches, but you've lost a lot of those people. And I don't know if they're going to come back again from what you had when CM Punk was there and what you had from when you were riding really high. But now, I mean, again, and people, some people can blame, 
us they can blame whoever they want to the fact of the matter is there's just not enough for fans to sink their teeth into and they everybody can blame everything else and blame us for talking about it and all that sort of stuff the bottom line is if you present something to the general public that they can find delicious and sink their teeth into they will Regardless of what we say about it, look at WWE and what they were doing with Roman Reigns and look at all the pushback they got through that whole bloodline storyline. I'm never going to watch WWE. I'm done with it. They believed in it. They saw it was working. They fed into it in the ways that they needed it to. AEW's done that as well, too. You know, for anything anybody wants to say about sensitive hangman page and all that stuff, guess what? He worked. He worked for what they needed to do. He worked to energize their fan base for anything anybody wants to say about Moxley. Moxley does the same thing for that fan base. It's just not enough of anything of what's going on right now. And that ties into something, Brian, with bringing back Hangman Page. I hope when he comes back, he's not conflicted. I don't need to see that version of Hangman Page. They don't need that version of Hangman Page anymore. I think he should still come back as a hero, come back in more of a, again, as much of a Magnum TA type of character as he can be, you know, but it doesn't seem like they're going to do that. And bringing him back as the wild card against Jeff Jarrett, if that's what they're going to do after that promo, after all of that stuff. Well, he'll have to be a heel. And we're going to get extra heat on Hangman Page now. I, I don't know if that's going to end up being the right decision either but we'll have to see it doesn't feel like it right now and it doesn't feel like out in the ether that people are dying to see hangman page come back and be again I, has this elite thing with the evps really worked other than okada saying what he says that seems to be the most over part of the whole deal this person here says i wanted to refer to a quote that osprey made when asked about the low viewership he said quote it's a bummer we should not be ignoring criticism We've got work to do, but it's lit a fire in me. I love seeing the transparency from someone within the company as him and hope they address the ongoing inconsistencies sooner than later. This person here says, I've been watching wrestling since 2017. Something has always bothered me. Sometimes the heels will attack the baby faces and the referee won't see it, so the match will continue and uh, the match will have a screwed up finish. Surely people like Tony Khan should run down to the ring, grab the microphone and say, this is BS, restart the match. Well, you have to book. Yeah, that's one of the things. It's one of the things, like you know that uh, that chair shot on uh, on AEW for the DQ. It's like I don't mind a DQ every now and then. It it helps you book. Like there's only so much you can do when everybody has to win or lose. But that was not the match where we needed a rare DQ to save face for Titan. Back in a moment. Give us a call. One eight hundred eight seven eight play. One eight hundred eight seven eight seven five two nine. Back in a moment. Observer live. All right, we're here on Fun Friday. We're going to take some calls. Michael Booble trying to get punched in the face here on Fun Friday. He didn't even think he'd show up today. Yeah, well, he was wrong. Mm -mm -mm. Now, 1-800-878-PLAY. 1-800-878-7529. Producer Daniel will pick up the call, and he'll put your name in this gimmick right here, and we'll we'll go to you. You can also text us, 425-780-780. 7566. I'll do text messages and phone calls here today. And uh, let's go. You're on the air, Hub. Who is this and where are you calling from? Yeah, it's Hub from Phoenix. Good to talk to you again, Brian, and good to finally talk to you, Mike. You guys make my weekday, so thanks a lot. Thank you. Um, Thank you. I, yeah. I just noticed that contract statuses, like people like Dijak, people like Natty, um, there's so much confusion around them these days, it seems like. We've had AEW people's contracts expire without any word, um, or they say there was no word from Tony Khan. Is there something about the current environment that is making contracts more up in the air or is it the the fed using it as a like a story element because of the the knowledge the insight that fans have that outlets like yours have now into them and are more widely reported than they were years ago um just wondering if you could speak you know speak on that all right i want to thank you very much for the call all i know i i I don't know I, I mean, yes, it's got a lot to do with it, Brian. Honestly, like overall, I think in the last, 
20 years, you know, people are more open about their situations and where they're at and talking to friends and friends and friends of friends of friends and things like that. So I think a lot of that information actually starts coming out. And also, it's always been a negotiating ploy as well, too. And something when it's out there, if you're a promoter or a booker, you can use that sort of stuff once it's out there and try to manipulate it. But uh, I know you got more thoughts on well, it. Well, I'll just it's say this. It's been there. It, well, yes. I think that's the important thing is like, I think that because this has come up with some frequency over the last couple of months, it feels new to people. But like, this has been happening forever. I mean, forever it has been reported. So-and-so's deal is is coming due or this or that. Now there have been a rash of them all at once. And so now people are kind of feeling like there's something different, but there's not. It, this has always happened. Now, there is one big difference uh, that, I, that relates to WWE, and that is that it's not WWE anymore. Yeah. It's now TKO. So literally, if you are under a WWE contract, everybody, everybody, every single last person in WWE, their contract is going to expire because you do not renew a WWE contract anymore. Now, everybody needs to transition over to a brand new TKO contract. And so I was told a while ago, like, you're going to be hearing a lot about this because everybody whose deal comes up, now they have to renegotiate a totally new deal with a totally separate company. And I'm sure it's largely the same in a lot of ways, but it's, it's, a, it's a transition period for WWE now where the old contracts are going away and new ones are being drafted for a brand new company. So I think that's... And then you always got things like, you know, sometimes things are storyline, like the MJF negotiations, which I don't buy for one second. I mean, no. you know, he uh, he re-signed a long time ago for a long time, and, uh, and it became a storyline. And, and, and that was one that they did, uh, you know, play into storyline, but it was it was not a legitimate deal or a good idea all right uh let's go to brandon from virginia beach you're on the air what's going on hey what's up guys hey um uh, my question is uh, when i'm watching dynamite and you know i'm looking at mjf when he gets upstaged by osprey and he's kind of stewing there in the corner do you think they're heading in a direction where they're turning MJF heel. I know he still gets cheered a lot, but with Osprey being your top babyface potentially, that could be make a position for MJF to be that top heel. Because it feels like there really is no top heel in the promotion who really gets that kind of big heat. I don't like that right now. It's actually funny. I want to thank you very much for the call, Brandon. Yeah, it's funny. It was only like six months ago. Remember, we were talking about how they have no top babyface. Yeah. Like all they have are heels, and you know. Now here we are, and it's totally swung the opposite direction, where now everybody is a babyface. Yeah. So I do believe that MJF stewing in the corner, you know, he he could be turning heel. And the thing with MJF is, you know, I think he'd he'd probably tell you this himself. You know, it's 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 it was a it was a difficult thing for him to go babyface. He didn't want to. You know, he is very, very comfortable, and he feels he is most effective as a heel. And, you know, before he actually turned babyface, you know, when he first came back and was super, super over, guys, remember how hard I argued that he should have gone babyface right out of the gate? And I was not the only one. Like, a lot of top guys in AEW were like, we need a young, top babyface, and he didn't want to do it. And eventually it was like, well, it's just, it is what it is. Like, it's got to happen. And he did it. And I think that when he went babyface, you know, I think he actually really came to like it. And, you know, then, of course, he ended up getting injured. And he was gone for six months. And in that six-month period, we turned Swerve, Will Ospreay's top babyface, you know, we've got like a lot of baby faces now to the point the where fans defaulted Joe. Yep, Joe. To the point, yeah, Joe was a baby face even when he was a heel. So the point is, like, well, now we've got a problem where we have so many baby faces that the main event of Forbidden Door is baby face versus baby face, and Swerve, who just turned baby face, now has to play the heel role 
against Will Ospreay. So yeah, they need, they probably now need MJF as top heel again. Because, you know, one of my big arguments with uh, when I wanted MGF to turn babyface was, like, we got a lot of babyfaces, or we got a lot of heels. We don't have that top babyface. You can be in that role. And now, it's like, he can't be in that role. We have too many top babyfaces. It's fine for him to go heel again. So, anyway... He needs to be an island at some point all unto himself when they wrap up whatever they're doing heel here because people are going to cheer him. They're going to boo him. He's like Ric Flair. Whatever role you need him in, that's fine. But make him individual of everybody else because when you bring Adam Cole back, people are going to cheer MJF because of what happened. He's going to be a baby face in that role dealing with Cole. I would assume so at least. But when you have him dealing with Osprey, who is a completely different personality, you can see how that grates with MJF. So to me, you need to take advantage of the fact that he is so malleable when it comes to what you need him to do as long as the storyline is good. Because one of the other things, Brian, is as good as he was and the things he was able to do, that storyline took a little bit too much off his fastball i think in hindsight i think you can absolutely say that so you need to be careful about how much vulnerability you let mjf show because he showed all of it there and i don't think it was beneficial long term because of how that whole storyline was constructed and how it played itself out you're talking about with him and adam cole yes that was the hottest thing in the company during that period those numbers were sky high for that stuff doesn't mean it was good, dude. Well, you know it what? It wasn't good, and it wasn't good long term, was it? Well, uh, here's the thing. Who is Kyle here's the O'Reilly thing. over? Were those skits good with Adam Cole from the phone? All of that stuff was. All I can tell you is good, this, bro. Listen, when you say something is not good, that is it's a subjective. Sub- it's a subjective opinion. Sure. However, when you see that it was the only thing in the company that was doing any real numbers, then that's an but objective Brian, when success. We, uh, no, in that moment, at that time, we were comparing that to things that they were doing before that that were doing better numbers. That's on the decline of what began this year and kept also slipping down well yes i don't care how much that that last pay-per-view world's end did i don't care i remember what it was in the moment i remember again having to compare that with what they were doing and going is this working and frankly it wasn't look again artistically subjectively no i didn't like it but I don't think you should. You can really shower that with that much praise and shine well, it up. Well, I, I can, and this is why. Because the reason that they had such a massive decline didn't have anything to do with MJF. Everything in the wake of Brawl Out, I mean, you can go back and trace all of this. And Brawl Out was when a lot of fans got disillusioned and they slowly started to get out. And it was it was declining, and it was declining. And when something like that is happening, and you can find even one thing to prop it up during that period, like you got to do it. They yes, try, we can well, look. They tried. We can, they hot shotted with po- playing the CM Punk footage, didn't they? They tried to. Hot that shot didn't that. work either. Exactly. That was even worse. Well, why Let's, do you hot shot? Because things aren't going well. And that was again. It, Hey, look, there were worse things that happened in that storyline. I just don't think it was beneficial at all. And it was the number one biggest all-encompassing thing on your show, and it engulfed MJF. And at that time, I still would say, when his MJF, I don't care what anybody thought of it artistically, was he at his best there? Did he do his best work there? Uh, no, he wasn't. Was he at his best for the company there? Was the company doing as well as he should have in that storyline? No. No. Bruce, you're on the air. What's up? Hey, yeah. So, a first time caller, long time listener. Uh, one thing is that the, the elite said they have a friend coming in to be the wild card. I know everyone thinks that's the hangman, but the friend, the guy they've been friendly with a lot lately is Christian Cage, and he's been feuding with Jay White, who just advanced on that side of the bracket. I was wondering if you guys think that Christian Cage being the wild card is a, a, a suitable role. Well, I want to thank you very much for the call. I think that's. Uh... Listen, hey, if I had to make a choice, is it going to be Hangman coming back to either lose in the tournament or lose again for the fourth time to swerve? Or is it going to be Christian? Well, I would I would go with Christian. Dude. And you know what? You know what you guys aren't going to like? Because I can already see it coming. Oh, and based no. on Mike's response, I think he can oh, as well. No. No. Christian 
always talks about no. dead fathers. Oh, he does. No. Am I wrong? No. I'm not it's saying that's... this is what they should do at all. Uh, but once that guy mentioned Christian's name, it's like, oh, my God. It's the Owen Hart Cup. Somebody has to beat Jarrett. It's going to be a heated thing. It's like what they do. Well, so he can go on and win the six-man tag team titles and feud with the House of Black? Oh, God, no. I don't know, man. Once he mentioned that, I was crestfallen. Oh, <laughs> so I was God. like, I can actually see this happening. And there's a there's the old pro wrestling part of me, and these are older pro wrestling guys, and you can there was a way back in the day it was a lot easier to justify doing something like that to get heat, but it's a different era. We've seen things Randy Orton using Eddie uh mjf with the quarters thing like we are in a much more sensitive time and i don't think with that character i don't know if that's what you want to go ahead and do hey i don't either but you know what it was almost anybody else too but owen hart i don't know oh i hate this idea but you know what you'd see it can't you Uh, yeah because he beats he beats jeff jarrett he tells the children i'll be your new father he's the biggest heel in the tournament he goes all the way to the end and then, of course, Brian Danielson defeats him, wins the Owen Hart Cup for Owen Hart's family. He's going to Wembley to fight for the world title, a title he's never won. The more I think about it, the more I think, oh, my God, that's what it they're going to do. It would be a great match. It would be incredible heat. I just I think it would be incredible heat, and I think it would be It's just a matter of is, is it good heat or not. Back in a moment with more Observer Live. Upon further reflection, now I'm about 99% sure it's going to be Christian. Because, listen, of the two names everyone's mentioning, or of the, the Hangman name, the Hangman was suspended by the Young Bucks. I know people say it was reluctantly or whatever, but they suspended the guy. Of the names, it makes way more sense that their friend is Christian, who they have been friends with on TV. And when it first started, remember, it was like, why are the Young Bucks and Christian even friendly? I don't even get why they're friendly right now. They, they just started this storyline. It was weird. Well, now I understand why. And as people are pointing out here, well, he ends up beating Jeff Jarrett, moves on to the next round where he would be facing Jay White. He beats Jay White, which also sets him up for a six-man title match, which they've been building up as well. And then he ends up going to the finals and losing to Brian Danielson. It actually, I mean... To me, if they do something different now, it's like, well, that isn't going to make any sense. <laughs> well, I guess we'll see what happens. Hey, it can be a last big singles match for Christian on that kind of stage as well, too, if you want to look at it that way. It's just going to be interesting to see how they navigate and how much they're going to have to navigate if they go ahead and use that story with a guy like Owen Hart, who was so beloved, and with the sensitivity that we're at right now with a lot of wrestling fans, how they would take to that it would, be, it would be, I will say that, it would be quite intriguing TV for me. Well, that was a fun Friday, everybody. I want to thank Bruce, yeah. who, by the way, it said Bruce from Connecticut. So I was like, Bruce Pritchard is calling in? And then the guy actually had a really good booking idea. Oh. I didn't say anything. But anyway, I want to thank all the callers here today. I'll be back later on this weekend. We've got a lot of shows, Forbidden Door. I'll be up with uh, Dave and uh, Vinny and Craig and everybody else on Sunday recapping that. And a lot of other fun stuff coming up as well. We got some cool stuff coming, and uh, we'll announce it soon. But that's it. Thanks, everybody. Wrestling Observer Live.